Hello guys, my name is Nash. Welcome to Thursday Tales of Terror. TTT. Today's story was suggested by Jillian. Thank you for suggesting. If some of you didn't know, I'm a freelance wedding photographer as well as editor. So for today's story, we will be talking about a wedding tragedy. I'm very familiar with weddings, especially Chinese weddings. And as some of you may know, they have a few traditions and customs to follow and some superstitions to take note of. And in today's case, many people believe that it was because of a tradition that the couple did not follow which resulted in this horrible tragedy. Also, today's video will be a little different. It's not a crime story but it's still tales of terror. It will be very interesting to people who don't really know much about the traditions of Chinese marriage. So let me give you a little background into the Chinese customs and traditions which will be related to today's story. Let's begin. It's no surprise that planning a wedding is very stressful and it may seem like the least of things to do is never ending. Apart from setting a reasonable budget and time for your dream wedding to happen, you have to pick the perfect outfits for you and your partner. You need to source for your wedding venue and wedding vendors and I think the fun part of it is when you get to decide on what theme, decor and details you want. Not all wedding traditions are the same and they vary according to nationality, country and religion. But for today, we're going to be looking at Chinese wedding traditions. Chinese wedding traditions and superstitions have more than 2,400 years of history and some of them have evolved over time to fit the modern world. Most couples would still follow these traditions for good luck. There's a lot of things to take note of, for example choosing a good wedding date. Chinese couples usually avoid getting married during certain months, especially during Ghost Month. Ghost Month is the seventh lunar month of the Chinese lunar calendar. It is the scariest month of the year. It is believed on the first day of the month, the gates of hell open up and ghosts are free to feed and enjoy themselves for one month. And in order to get a really good wedding date, some couples might even seek the help of a feng shui master to help them calculate. But some lucky numbers are 2, 8 and 9. 2 means double, double the joy. So it is usually considered a good number. And 8 is the luckiest number because it is similar to the pronunciation of the word prosper. Number 9 is also a very lucky number especially for weddings because it has the same pronunciation as long lasting. That's why some people prefer to have their weddings on the 9th, 19th or 29th to hope for an enduring marriage. Some unlucky numbers to avoid are 4 and 7 because they represent death. And with dates, there are auspicious timings to take note of as well. The Teochew believe that the bride should enter the groom's family home before sunrise. So that's pretty early. And if you have seen pictures of Chinese weddings before, you would notice that some of the brides are being sheltered by a red umbrella. This is to ward off any negative elements. And the bride could usually be seen throwing a red foldable fan out of the car window as she leaves the bridal car. This symbolizes the bride leaving behind her past, bad habits and any negativity as she embarks on a new chapter of her life. These are just a few of the many traditions and customs to follow and superstitions to take note of. I would also like to talk about how colours play an important role in Chinese weddings. Essentially, no matter what themes you are going for, red is the most important colour and symbol for a happy marriage. Besides red, some good luck colours such as purple, gold and pink are great choices for your wedding decorations. Some taboo colours for Chinese weddings are white and black. White and black are usually reserved for funerals and events that are related to death and gold. Thus, people believe they would bring bad luck to the newlyweds. Now, would this be the case for Mr. Vernon Leong Jinwei and his wife, Miss Karine Pei Li Ling? Although there's not much information about their background, the couple was known to be very sweet and loving with each other. Vernon, who was 31, was said to be a well-built man in good health and was the eldest of three children. He used to run a shop in Simlim Square selling computer peripherals with his business partner, Mr. Gan, who was also 31. Business was doing well and no matter how busy the day was, Vernon would always make it a point to call Kareen every day. According to one of Vernon's ex-employee, Mr. Chen, Vernon would sometimes come into the shop for half a day and after that go out to spend the rest of his time with Kareen. The couple often went on holidays too. They had been together for six years and they were looking forward to a happy life together. Kareen, who was 27, worked as an IT product distributor. Many would describe Kareen as a cheerful and outgoing person. At times when Vernon had supper with his colleagues after work, work, 
Celine would usually join them and they all really had a great time together. Life was also going pretty well for Corinne. A month before her wedding was going to happen, she had actually quit her job to join a new firm. And the couple had also just got the keys for a new flat in the Sengkang Pongol area. On November 3rd, 2009, on what was supposed to be the first day of the rest of their lives together, Karine became a widow. Hours after businessman Vernon Leong celebrated his wedding banquet, his family and friends found themselves preparing for his funeral. The couple had chosen a ballroom in Hilton, Singapore to hold their wedding banquet with about 300 guests invited. It is believed the couple's fate was sealed when they decided on the black theme for their wedding banquet. Black decoration for the tables and chairs as as well as black uniforms for the waitresses. But I believe that it's common for waitresses to be wearing black. In almost all the weddings I photographed, I recall that almost all the hotels, their waiters and waitresses were wearing black. But for tables and chairs and decors to be black, I don't think I've really seen it a lot. The 10 cost Chinese dinner in the Hilton Ballroom ended at about 11pm. The bride and groom greeted guests and took pictures at all 30 tables. Now, when the couple went around each table to take photos, some of their guests made the couple drink alcohol and it's pretty common to offer a toast to celebrate their marriage. After most of the 300 guests had left, a group of about 10 close friends accompanied the couple to their suite on the 10th floor for more drinks and celebrations. The mood was happy as they talk about the events of the day from the frenzied preparations in the morning to the dinner events. According to his business partner and close friend Mr. Gunn, Vernon had about three glasses of red wine and brandy. He was a bit high but definitely not drunk. Vernon was known to be a very good drinker because he was a regular at pubs along Boat Quay but rarely got drunk. Shortly after 1am, the party broke up and went their separate ways. After everyone had left, Corrine took a shower but after she emerged emerged from the bathroom, she discovered that her husband was not in the room and raised the alarm. Security cameras showed Vernon leaving the room at about 3am and rushing barefoot through the hotel's second floor. Minutes later, he was dead, having fallen from a height and landing on the hotel's driveway. He was pronounced dead by paramedics at 3.35am. Nobody knew why he really left the room and the sudden turn of events left everyone shocked and devastated. A wake was being held near Vernon's parents' flat in Balam Road. Kareen clad in a black jacket and shorts wailed and had to be supported by friends when she viewed her husband's body, which arrived at about 5pm. About 50 friends and relatives turned up in somber colours, many in tears at how the couple's happiest day had ended in such sorrow. It was later revealed that on his wedding night, Vernon had struggled to find his way back to his bride in their hotel room. Fumbling his way in the dark, Vernon ended up on a ledge where he toppled over and fell to his death. With the help of 13 closed-circuit TV clips, Vernon's death was pieced together at the coroner's inquiry. It was unclear why Vernon left the room barefooted and clad only in a white tank top and checkered shorts. He can be seen making his way towards the 10th floor exit to the stairway. What he did not know was that he could not return to the corridor once the door closed behind him, as he had entered a one-way access fire exit staircase. However, there was no CCTV coverage from the 24th to the 6th floor. The next footage of Vernon showed him walking down from the 5th floor stairway till he reached the hotel's basement one. During this descent, his arms were folded across his chest and he walked at a steady pace, occasionally looking at his surroundings. Normally, the only exit from the one-way access stairway is at basement one, but even there, one must seek the help of security or hotel staff using an intercom system. There is no evidence Vernon used this system. The CCTV footage shows him trying to push open the doors both on the first floor and on basement one without success. Shortly thereafter, a certain urgency seemed to grip Vernon. He headed up the stairs two steps at a time using his hands to grip the railing for support. He then made his way back to the fourth floor when he chanced upon a door leading to an air handling unit. AHU room. The room's door was supposed to have been closed at all times. However, it was kept open by a metal rod. An investigating officer told the court that wiring works were conducted there from September to October. The rod hung to prevent the wires from being crushed by the door was still hanging there in November. Vernon entered the dark AHU room and from there he found a door that led to a rooftop 13.3 meters above the driveway. The rooftop was not well lit and had no railings. 
CCTV footage showed Vernon falling onto the hotel driveway at 3.25am. His body bounced once from the impact. An autopsy report showed he had alcohol levels high enough to cause confusion, impaired judgment and unsteadiness. The state coroner recorded a verdict of misadventure on Vernon's death. He concluded that Vernon had accidentally fallen to his death as among other things he appeared tired, disoriented and under the effects of alcohol which likely kicked in later after his round of drinks. Hilton Singapore extended its condolences to Vernon's family. Its spokesperson, however, did not address the the issue of why the metal rod had not been removed. Questions were being raised by netizens like why wasn't the AHU room locked and why weren't the fire exit doors equipped with an alarm system and a warning sign. After what happened, family, relatives and friends of Kareen were very worried about her and they didn't want her to be alone. So in the beginning of 2010, she moved back to live with her mother and her elder sister. They would take turns to keep a tight watch over her especially after she expressed a wish to kill herself but perhaps the pain of losing her husband was too much to bear. Perhaps his unexplained death became a tipping point. On July 5, 2010, just eight months after her husband's death, Kareen, 28, was found dead at the foot of Block 540, Haugang Street 51. It is believed that she had fallen from the sixth story while her family was asleep. Just before she fell, Kareen's older sister had seen her sitting on the sofa in the living room just staring into space. The sister did not think anything was amiss and went to bed. But not long after, she was woken by Kareen's dog. She went to Kareen's room but she wasn't there. She then rushed downstairs to check and found her sister in a pool of blood. Her white slippers were found two meters from her body. Kareen, the second of three sisters, had died on the spot. According to residents, it was in the early hours when they heard loud wails. A resident living on the second floor immediately walked to the staircase landing after she heard the cries and saw one of Kareen's sister squatting by the lift and wailing very loudly. Another resident saw Kareen's two sisters and mother rushing to her body. The younger sister was hysterical and repeatedly hit her head against a wall at the void deck. The elder sister, who was still wailing, also tried to pull the younger sister back but was not strong enough to stop her. In the end, it was a male relative who managed to stop the woman. Nearby, their mother sat sobbing inconsolably. The wailing continued till 5am after Kareen's body was taken away to the mortuary. Those who knew Kareen thought she was beginning to put her grief behind her. They did not see this coming. Many who knew Kareen were in disbelief. A neighbour even said that she had seen Kareen with her sister the day before her death and she looked happy. But the truth was, Kareen had been an emotional wreck ever since her husband's unfortunate death on the night of their wedding. Kareen's grief at the loss of her husband was revealed through the two diaries she kept after her husband died. She wrote of her undying love for him and her wish to be with him even in death. She had made a total of 240 entries, mostly of them stating that she missed him and wondered if he had met something dirty on that fateful night, which she referred to meeting something supernatural. Also, in her diary, Karin told him that she would wait for him at his home so that he could tell her what happened on the night of his death. Why did you have to go and leave your darling baby alone? Did you meet something dirty? Did someone hurt you? Please talk to me, okay? She wrote. Her family got to know of her diaries and often checked on them to understand Kareen's mental condition. They would keep a close eye on her and ensure she was not alone. It was reported that this wasn't Kareen's first suicide attempt and that Kareen had slit her wrist and drank bleach but was rushed to Tan Tok Seng Hospital in time, where she was put on suicide watch. She was also prescribed antidepressants. After less than two weeks, Kareen was discharged after showing an improvement in her mental state. She would go for checkups after that and in January 2010, she even told the doctor that she didn't want to die because hell did not want me. But she was observed to be more cheerful. However, the doctor's verdict reveals that though the short-term risk has been resolved, long-term prognosis remains guarded. On the 26th of March 2010, Kareen visited the clinic with her sister and claimed that the stopping of medication worsened her mood. She was then prescribed more antidepressants and requested for the follow-ups to be held once in four months as she was starting a new job and would not be able to commit to the schedule until after confirmation. On the 14th of April 2010, Kareen's sister visited the clinic on her behalf to get more of the medication as it helped her sleep better. On the 4th of July at around 3 p.m. M, Kareen visited her late husband's niche with his brother before heading to dinner with a female friend at Changi Beach.
beach. After dinner, they head to Beach Culture Cafe for a drink and call it a night at about 10pm. On the 5th of July, between 1 and 2am, Karine's dog's whining woke her sister up and she decided to check Karine's room but she was not there. Police receive a call at around 1.50am from a neighbour informing them about the body at the foot of the block and that's where Karine was found dead. She died due to multiple fractures. As mentioned earlier, one of Karine's coping mechanisms was writing in her diary and her entries were getting more and more desperate. It's absolutely heartbreaking. She wrote about ending her life but she doesn't want her husband to be sad. She doesn't want to be alone in this world and she really wants to go on a honeymoon and live a life together as husband and wife. She would count the days and write it in her diary and she really misses her husband terribly. And for Karine, Time didn't heal her or make her feel better at all. Her desire to be with her husband grew stronger every passing day. With that being said, family members need to seek help if a relative has shown signs of being capable of hurting him or herself. Watching over the person all the time can be very difficult and not to mention draining on family members. One option is to admit them to hospital to get the help they need. Although this can be a difficult process, I believe with the right help, support and environment, they might be able to get better. They will be in a safe environment where they are constantly monitored. It's still a mystery as to why Vernon would suddenly leave his hotel room and not wear any footwear. Where was he heading? Why didn't he take the lift? Many people can't help but wonder if there were any supernatural links to this case. Even his own wife had her suspicions about it, seeing how she wrote in the diary asking for answers if he had encountered anything dirty. His behaviour was very bizarre as he could be seen having an urgency to get out of somewhere out of a sudden. And I've read some comments saying that Vernon actually wanted to find a place to smoke but if I'm not wrong, he left the hotel room empty-handed. What did Vernon see and experience at his last moments? Was it really the effects of alcohol? Could it be the black theme wedding that they opted for that many believe to be the cause of their tragedy? We will never truly know. I hope that the two of them are together right now. As always, thank you for being with me this Thursday. Let me know what you guys think. Remember to like and subscribe if you like my content. Stay safe and I hope to see you guys again next Thursday.